Coming up this week on the Thomas Jefferson Hour, we welcome back one of our favorite guests, uh, Professor Joseph Ellis. I just I can't get enough of that guy and his insight uh, and his knowledge. The two of you are a good match, sir. I'm the uh, Dean Martin to his Jerry Lewis. You know, he's <laughs> uh, he's so extraordinary. He's colorful. He's funny. He laughs a lot. He doesn't take any of this too seriously, but he's always filled with insights. I adore him, and he's been such a generous friend to come on the Jefferson Hour quite frequently, right. and now he's a regular guest. Right, and there was one thing that I missed this week, and I bet you can guess what it is. His dog barking in the background. We, right, we didn't hear his labradoodles joining the conversation. But you, The two of you really um, got in depth on a, a number of issues. You talked a lot about um, the importance of presidential leadership. Um, and I tried to pull us back out of the 18th century now and again. You know, the thing that really impressed me most was, you know, not to give away everything at the moment, but he, he's very, very, very hard on Donald Trump as the president um, at this moment for this crisis and ranks him about as um, uh, weak um, as anyone could possibly be in the face of, of this moment in American history. But, you know, I don't think he does it as a partisan. I don't think he does it happily. I think he, as a historian, he's looking at the qualities that you want in a leader in a time of international crisis. He, he knows whereof he speaks. He's a biographer of George Washington. He's a biographer of John Adams. He knows what there is to know about Thomas Jefferson. He's written about the war, about those moments when the, the cause of the American independence movement was nearly snuffed out on Long Island and then at the northern tip of Manhattan. He's been with George Washington at Valley Forge. He was with Jefferson um, at Botticello when Bannister Tarleton invaded um, during the last days of, of the revolution. You know, if ever anyone has earned the right to sort of survey American presidential leadership and to draw some conclusions, I think it's Dr. Joseph Ellis. I do apologize uh, to any listeners who are offended by his remarks, but I think that they are uh, really worth thinking about. And he contrasts the current president with um, Governor Andrew Cuomo of New York, um, uh, much to the benefit of, of Governor Cuomo. But that's just part of it. We also talk about this series we're going to do uh, in the next few weeks when we're all in sequestration, um, uh, going over the, the letters between Adams and Jefferson beginning in, in their reconciliation in 1812 all the way through their simultaneous deaths on July 4th, 1826. That'll be four programs and then we're going to do at least one and maybe two more on my new book, Repairing Jefferson's America, A Guide to Civility and Enlightened Citizenship, because Joe read it and praised it and, and wants to talk about it. But he also thinks, and this is really an important uh, argument, David, he, he, his view is that, look, Jefferson had a certain kind of Republican mind, but that time has passed. We're a global nation. We have bases all over the world. We live in a time of cruise missiles and nuclear weapons. The economy is infinitely more complex than it was then. That, that that was then and this is now. And you can't, in this time, even talk about being a republic in any Jeffersonian sense. And he faults me in my book for saying we can still be a republic in some meaningful ways if we will only do X and Y and Z. And Joe's view is no. Uh, that, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a historical fossil. That's it's, we can't make Jefferson's vision uh, have any traction in a world of, of cyber terror and uh, Islamo fascism and so on. I, I do think it's very important. Uh, perhaps next week we can do this uh, that we address some mail from some of the listeners. We've we've received a lot of it. Um, everything from. Uh, ideas about what people can do during this time to what they're reading and things you asked to, for people to let us know about. I, I think it's important that we we do at least a show or maybe a couple um, based on comments from our listeners and their questions and comments. Of course, and we're asking for more so that if you'd like to tell us what you're reading, what you're thinking, what your fears are, uh, how things look in your own community, um, how you intend to use this time of sequestration, um, you know, how you think this is going to work itself out. Um, those reflections, the more you put on paper and send to us, the happier we are. And we'll include 
some of them in the program. I also have a couple of announcements. David, the Lewis and Clark trip is still on for late July. I hope that happens. Fingers crossed. We're not canceling. It's a it's the safest place in the world at that time. You just have to get to Great Falls. Uh, I'm also going to do two online courses. Uh, one, a four-part course on pandemics, and there's information at the jeffersonhour.com site about that, but I'm looking for people to sign up. There's a fee, uh, but that keeps the Jefferson Hour and its host alive through a very difficult time when I'm grounded. And secondly, a longer program, which I'm very excited about, eight parts on the Enlightenment. Um, and there are texts for these. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, write me via the Jefferson Hour, say, I, I want to I be part of this, let me know. And we will get all this information to you, but the, these courses will occur in later April and all of May. So those are two things that are coming. The winter encampments are on for Loxaw Lodge next January. We're also planning a Jefferson in a Virginia trip for October. So watch for that. All these things um, you can find out more about at jeffersonhour.com. In other words, we're not just uh, getting through this. We're reinventing some of the things that we do. And I'll, I'll just be David Swenson for a moment. If you care about the Thomas Jefferson Hour and you and you believe that it's performing an important function during this time or any time, uh, and you're and disposed to help us, now is a great time to do it. I take no money from it. David Swenson takes no money from it. All the money is really spent just to keep the program on the air, and we're immensely proud of it. And I have to say, I this uh, crisis has really opened uh, some really interesting doors for me to look at the history and literature of pandemics and and to dig in on certain Jefferson questions. For example, the yellow fever epidemic of uh, Philadelphia in 1793, and also Jefferson and smallpox. Jefferson was one of the champions of the of the true smallpox vaccine when Edward Jenner devised it in 1796. And so this um, this crisis has really given me a chance to turn the lens to some things that have played um, a lesser uh, importance in my own thinking uh, up till now. And I so uh, completely appreciate that. And I thank all of you for listening to the program. I hope that you find it clar clarifying, useful, rational, and grammatical. Uh, that that would be enough for me. <laughs> Grammatical. I'm working on that. With that, let's go to this week's show. And again, special thanks to uh, Professor Ellis for his time. Yeah, he was just uh, extraordinary. I, I just love his spirit in addition to his great mind. Good day, citizens, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. We're so pleased that you joined us, and we hope that you are all safe and healthy. We're very excited this week to welcome back one of our favorite guests on the Thomas Jefferson Hour, a good friend of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. Joseph Ellis. Thank you so much, uh, and I'm, I'm calling, I'm speaking to you from the Green Mountains of Vermont, where I'm in quarantine with my wife and my two Labradoodles. And are your supplies holding out, sir? Yeah, yeah, I mean, so far so good. Well, that's good. Let's let's make sure it stays that way. Before you and Clay begin to discuss many matters, which I know you're you're anxious to talk about, uh, I wanted to think back to a previous conversation with you, uh, Joe. You talked about well, the country is so divided these days, and you made some comment about how it's going to take a major event to change that. Do you think we've arrived? Well, that's a very very good question. Um... We certainly have arrived at a major event. This is a genuine crisis. The virus has the potential to kill as many people or more people that have been killed in any war in American history, save the Civil War, and um, maybe even more than that. Um, uh, I think that's one of the things we'll end up talking about today, you know, in a kind of what would Jefferson do fashion. But the answer to your question is yes, and that it's ironic, and because the phrase "together alone" is an interesting phrase that describes us as we are in our separate quarantined places, but we're doing it together as as part of a commitment to a policy that of social distancing that will shorten the lifespan of this this virus in the United States and. Um, uh, and I'm uh, so that a sense this is also an occasion when leadership um, happens that you can get leadership 
without, well, excuse me, you need a crisis to have leadership. So you can have a crisis and not have leadership. Um, as I read the situation thus far, however, uh, and I would be interested in Clay's thoughts and other thoughts on this, the leader who stepped forward in the most uh, conspicuous fashion is the governor of New York, Andrew Cuomo. And he embodies a certain posture towards this disease, a confidence, a realistic reports to his constituents and to an American audience. And, um, and that that's the person who, um, and I don't believe either President uh, Trump or um, Vice President Biden have responded to this in a way that that demonstrates leadership. Let me ask you a question about that, Joe, uh, and welcome back, as as you are always so welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. This is maybe a bit of an unfair question, but, but it, you're going to ask lot. it anyway, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. You've known a lot of uh, presidencies in the course of your life as a as a citizen and as a um, historian. If you if you could have any single president of your lifetime be at the helm at this moment, which one would it be? Of my lifetime, huh? Hmm. Uh, I've, I've got a question for you that's going to grow out of this, but I'll I'll try to answer this one. I, I, some speculation. Um. Barack Obama, uh, his response to the Ebola crisis was was really first rate and created an infrastructure to respond to subsequent pandemics that um, unfortunately um, President Trump eliminated. Um, but that um, uh, I, he's the one who comes to mind. I would say JFK is right in there as well. Um, uh, I mean, I think Eisenhower would have been good, and I, and um, I think Truman would have been good too. So that those are the people. I mean, all of them. Uh, Obama, most specifically, because we know from from the record that he faced such thing, and we know what he did, and it was successful. When I hear you say that, uh, Joe. I hear you speaking in a nonpartisan way. In other words, you have a politics. We all have a politics. But I think you're saying from sheer analytic capacity for uh, for clarity of message, for purposefulness of approach, for confidence in government's capacity to get involved in something like this and help to sort it out, to marshal the resources of the nation and to speak to the people in a clear, rational and reassuring way. I, I think those are the criteria you're using, aren't they? Yes, I, I believe they are. I mean, all of us probably have prejudices that we that, that are more prejudicial than we think. But um, I'm trying my best to be a responsible historian, if you will, of this in terms of making a um, dispassionate assessment. Um, let me let me turn the question to you in a second, if, if I may, because I sure. it's an important question and. Um, um, because it's how you assess leadership. Um, you are familiar with, and very familiar with two of the most important presidents in American history. One is the man after whom this hour is named. The other is Theodore Roosevelt. Which of those two would you rather have in charge now? That is a great question. I would add um, at least one more to that mix, and, and that's uh, George Washington. I've, I've been reading a lot about well, I know him. I a lot about him, too, yeah. I've just read uh, uh, Chernow's book, which I like. I've, I, I've, I recently reread your book, His Excellency, which I like even better. Um, and, and, of course, we you can't help but look at Washington without um, a really deep sense of his greatness in so many different areas. But... Uh, to answer your question directly, I would have Jefferson involved, and I'll tell you why. Jefferson was as close to a rationalist um, as we are ever likely to get, and he did not, except in his private letters to Madison, he did not uh, engage in a rhetorical bombast or excess. When he was acting as a public figure, uh, anytime he held office as Secretary of State in the Washington administration, uh, as the third president of the United States, as governor of Virginia, when he held office, his responses to everything were exceedingly rational, measured, and cautious. And I think what we need more than anything else in a moment like this is 
the truth and the truth modulated in a way that reassures us that uh, we live in a, in a world where human beings are up to the challenge of sorting out uh, their difficulties. I, of course, I think Roosevelt would take charge in a way that Jefferson would never dare. Uh, that's that's the liability of Jefferson is that Jefferson, there's something, sl- I want, I'll stop as soon as I finish this little tiny passage because I want your response to this part of it. There's something a little elusive about Jefferson. He slips the noose. He, he disappears on you. He, he ducks certain moments of potentially great responsibility, whereas Roosevelt never saw a situation that he didn't just plunge into. What do you think about that as an assessment of of a weakness in Jefferson? I agree with it, and I think it's even the reason why I would clearly pick Roosevelt instead of Theodore Roosevelt over Jefferson. Um, I mean, uh, the way you describe Jefferson is true, but um, correct, but um, remember that Jefferson's not good in wartime. Jefferson and we're at war here with with nature, I guess, with the virus. But that um, remember when he's governor of Virginia and uh, the British are invading, and he doesn't even seem to do anything about it, and then he's sort of caught at Monticello and almost trapped by uh, the cavalry of uh, the sky. Uh, Tarleton. Car- right. Yeah. Bannister Tarleton. So, Tarleton, a real. He's a guy. He's a British. Um, Cavalry colonel who once bragged that he had uh, killed more patriots and laid with more American women than any person in the British Army. Oh, and, dear. Um, uh, but I mean, and Jefferson comes under scrutiny and criticism from Patrick Henry in Virginia in the wake of that for fleeing. And um, I mean, I don't know what the hell he was supposed to do—just stay there and be captured. Um, but it was it really it really rankled Jefferson for the whole rest of his life. It, it, he looked like he was a coward. He wasn't. Um, um, but I think that the the more important point is um, the Jefferson. I mean, the, well, to me right now, one of the major failures of the current president, Donald Trump is to delegate so much of the operational response to this virus to the states and not to require us as a people and a nation to uh, maintain social distancing by quarantining ourselves. Um, That is going to cost us big time in terms of lives lost and casualties, I'm afraid. I agree with you. I, I think you want a Hamiltonian now. I think this is the time w- when you want a Hamiltonian. That's right. There are times for Jefferson. There are times for Hamilton. There are times for I mean, Washington is a man for all seasons in some sense. Um, but um, that that I would go with Theodore Roosevelt in this moment, um, who I regard as the second greatest Republican president in American history uh, after Lincoln. Um, and... Um, uh, that we, the, in what did he call his movement? New nationalism, right? Right. Jefferson didn't really think we were a nation. He thought we were always a confederation. Um, and um, and I really think that a national response to this um, is is absolutely essential. And thus far, we are not providing. We, the leadership at the top is not providing that. Um, I mean, and this, again, this could mean the difference between what's thousands of casualties and what turns out to be literally millions of casualties. We're speaking to Dr. Joseph Ellis, who is the author of a range of incredibly interesting books on the early national period. It's hard to mention favorites. I mentioned His Excellency about George Washington, um, the Passionate Sage, the character of John Adams, which I think is my favorite because it's about John Adams. Um, American Sphinx, the character of Thomas Jefferson, um, and most recently, American Dialogue, The Founders and Us, all of these by one of our favorite guests, Joseph Ellison. I have an announcement to make. Um, Professor Ellis and I are going to be doing on this program a series of discussions of the, of the correspondence, uh, especially in the retirement years between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, one of the richest areas in the lives of either of these great 
founding fathers. Uh, but that we'll announce a little bit later. For the moment, we need to take a short break. When we come back, I have two questions about the current situation to ask Joseph Ellis, and then we will move on to Thomas Jefferson. You're listening to a special edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. We're speaking this week, and we're so pleased to be speaking with Professor Joseph Ellis. And when we took our break, Clay, you said you had a couple of questions for him. I want to tiptoe carefully around this, Joe, because I don't think this is necessarily the time for the blame game. I think we're in a a national, even international crisis. We're going to get through it as as best we can. But, But you're a historian. We can't help but talk about these in some, in some ways, and and here's here's one question about Donald Trump. Given his interest in authoritarian solutions, you know, he often says, you know, he, he wished he had the same powers that some of the the uh, strong men have in other nations. Um, you know, to the what extent he's joking about these things is sort of hard to assess, but he certainly has a an admiration for autocrats. Uh, you would have thought in a crisis like this that he would behave as a, not only a Hamiltonian, but a super Hamiltonian. Can you make sense of the fact that he has been essentially passive and that he has leaned on the 10th Amendment and left so much of this to the states when any rational approach to this, anything, if you listen to the news, even for a single evening, you get the sense that everyone is calling for stronger central refereeing of the distribution of, of medical equipment. Everyone's asking for better coordination, for uh, a stronger national voice. What do you make of this paradox that this man who who seems so attracted to, to top-down strong leadership is is being essentially passive in the face of this most extraordinary challenge of our lifetime. I agree with the question. It is a legitimate, I mean, to me, it's a very legitimate and uh, disconcerting question. I've thought about it, so I've got an answer that is uh, very specific. For him to create a truly national government policy at this point is an undermining of all that the Republican Party has been claiming it is since Reagan. That is, um, the government is them rather than us. And the various think tanks, American Heritage Society, Cato Society, Federalist Society, American Enterprise Institute, as conservative institutions uh, have endorsed what is essentially an anti-government view of the United States of America. It's almost that the term United States is a plural rather than singular noun. And it's not my view of what the founders intended. Maybe Jefferson did, however. You can argue that very easily, I think. In fact, I suspect he did. But um, it is a point of view, a constitutional and political point of view, that would limit anybody responding to this crisis to a state-based approach to it. Now, to me, that can be, that's the only possible explanation for President Trump's behavior. I mean, a cynic could say, well, he wants to lay it on the state so that when things go wrong, he's got somebody to blame. I don't, I'm not that cynical. I think this is a serious conviction here that um, you're not supposed to do this. Now, it, it is at odds with, as you say, his, his admiration of dictators. It's, it doesn't make rational sense. And that, and the only explanation that I can come up with and it, uh, is the one I've just offered. I have a comment and then one last question about, about where we are at this moment with this president. My comment is that I could not agree with you more about uh, Governor Andrew Cuomo. I've been watching his uh, briefings and I... I, I wish that I could say that everyone feels the same way as you and I do, but but I feel that's what leadership looks like in a pandemic. I think that he's rational. He's passionate when he needs to be passionate. He has a temper if he needs to use it. His, he has a deep compassion for the suffering of people. You can tell that he means it, that it's not just some sort of a Nixonian political posturing. Uh, he gets tough when he needs to get tough. Uh, he knows what he's talking about. Uh, he he does he doesn't use filler. He he's on point. Um, he's directing this. He's not afraid to use even extra constitutional powers in New York if necessary to get the state of New York through it. It's the epicenter, at least for the moment, in the United States. There's something uh, very reassuring 
about the way Andrew Cuomo has handled this. And he's, in a sense, a shadow president. And, of course, that raises all sorts of interesting questions. Um, but 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 here's the here's the the sick place we are. It goes back to what um, De- David Swenson asked you at the beginning of this program. We are so uh, drunk with partisanship and mutual distrust in these two Americas that even the people who should be saying Andrew Cuomo ex- is exemplary can't do it because they're so locked into their partisanship that they must not approve even of masterful leadership in the state of New York. That's got to tell you that we're really in deep trouble. If that's true, and I take your word for it, I mean, um, I, I don't float the, across the internet searching for uh, alternative explanations, so maybe I haven't encountered this. Most of the friends I've talked to, you know, agree with your assessment of, uh, of uh, Como and that they, they, they think, boy, the Democratic Party would be best served by getting rid of Biden and putting Cuomo right in there, which is not going to happen. <laughs> I, I think that in that sense, if you're correct in your assessment and certain people on the right have criticized Cuomo because they, they're prejudiced against him, that really is bad um, uh, because the leadership is is recognizable to any sensible, rational human being, it seems to me. And, um, uh, and there's no question that he's displayed it. Joe, you say you're not that cynical. May I be for a mm, moment? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> it, I think it's, it, it's, a, it's a fact that there's uh, maybe not a majority, but there's a great many Americans who really like reality TV in their government. And I think for the first time, Trump has come up with somebody who's better at reality TV than he is, and that would be Andrew Cuomo. From Trump being the smartest guy in the, in the room to Cuomo saying, you know, I don't really know everything. I don't understand it all. I listen to the experts tell me what what to think about. Do you think I'm real far off in that? No, I mean, I honestly think, you know, that when I see the president's uh, press conferences, it raises to relief and higher visibility the basic traits that he's always had, um, even before he was president. And everything is about him. It's about, and um, he has difficulty with any form of detachment or any form of empathy. But a lot of them, a lot of Americans like that. I mean, you know, I don't want to come off like we're just bashing Trump, mm. but a lot of Americans like that. Cuomo, on the other hand, is doing what I think is more productive and constructive in, in giving people the truth, the facts, whether it's good for him or not. And I, I think people respond to that as well. Joe, let me ask you uh, two last little questions about this, and then I want to move back to um, to Philadelphia 1793 here for a moment. Of the presidents in your lifetime, to be at the helm at a time like this, I even hate to ask it, who's the person you would least want to be the president of the United States at this time? And I'm guessing you're going to say ABT, anybody but this one. Uh, I'm afraid, yes. I mean, I think George W. Bush... Uh, made one huge mistake in Iraq, but that um, he was a good man. And his father, I think, was even a greater man. Um, um, I think Reagan would have responded well to this and would have had the rhetorical capacity to bring us together. JFK was proven, the Cuban Missile Crisis was the great crisis that had potential to destroy the world, and he handled that well. I mean, I'm I'm going across Republican and Democrats, but um, I, I don't think there's a single person. You know, I, I don't remember Franklin Roosevelt. I don't really remember Truman, but I sort of remember Truman. And uh, that, um, boy, I'm getting up there. Um, I think that um, the one, the president we have before us is unprecedented in that regard. And so, I, and I just want to emphasize, I know some of our listeners will be offended by some of this talk. But 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 I know you're not saying these things glibly or easily or even with joy. You're saying these things, I can hear it in your voice, with a deep concern about the gravity of this problem. I you know I want to support President Trump, and I mean God knows I wouldn't you know being in charge at a moment like this is is you know really dangerous. I mean you know, nobody would want to do it. Um, um, but I think that. Um, 
that his friends um, are unfortunately strengths that have led him and his and people that listen carefully to him to downplay and to not take seriously the full implications of this epidemic. At several points in time, and even now, most people who don't really want to in social distance, and um, and that that has huge consequences. And so my regret is genuine regret. Let me change the subject because I think this is going to be fun. I know you're going to you're going to uh, you're going to howl outrage for the, when I start, but um, you're the leading expert on the second president of the United States, one John Adams. Uh, try to imagine Adams at the helm. <laughs> um, Adams was good in a crisis too. Uh, he he tended to be bad when things were really calm because then he would <laughs> let go with some of his own vituperations and silliness. And um, but um, uh, Adams understood strategic forces in the world and large forces very well, both in 1776 when he was um, serving in the Continental Congress and was the leader. He was the leader that moved us towards independence. Even Jefferson said that. He was our atlas on the floor. And um, uh, and then again, um, when he made a decision, um, or well, as president of the United States in 1790 to keep us out of war with France, um, it was something called the quasi war was going on, and um, there was a there was a strong popular opinion to go to war uh, against France. And if if Adams had decided to do that, I'm I'm virtually certain he would have been reelected in 1800, which would have been, Jefferson would have been defeated. And remember, Adams defeated Jefferson in the election of 1796 by a very narrow margin, to be sure. But I think that. He's the man you want to have in a crisis too, um, and um, uh, and um, he he's dispositionally vituperative and uh, volcanic, um, but he harnesses those incredible energies and passions in ways in a crisis that are difficult to beat. And um, he said, "There's only one person who was better at him at that, and that was Washington." That had to, that was something that uh, took some. Um, Adams didn't like to admit that anybody was. Better. No, he didn't like to admit that Washington was a greater man, but he knew it was true. It was. It was. Yes. So, all right. Let me ask a different question then, and, and this has been bothering me about Adams. I, I just have been reading Gordon Wood's book about friendship divided, um, which is a really I like interesting that book. I mean, well, oh, never mind. We'll go ahead. But I, I, I want to hear. I, I want to hear. Your I didn't. I don't think Gordon understands Adams, but. And Gordon is one of the great historians of the early republic. There's no question about well, it. Well, I want to hear I want to hear your analysis of that. But before I do, here's here's my beef with Adams. In his letters to Mercy Otis Warren, which you write about so brilliantly, and in his letters to Jefferson in in, in the post retirement period, he keeps saying, "I've been misunderstood all my life. That I've been a monarchist. People call me an aristocrat. They say I believe in subordination. They say that I that, that and all this stuff." that I'm an Anglophile, uh, and he said, none of this has ever been true. I've always been misunderstood. He said, I know I'm going to be misunderstood. I knew I was going to be misunderstood when I wrote it. But you know what? If you read any of these things that he wrote, it's not as if this was imposed on him from outside. I mean, he, what's the? how do you sort this out, that he can't stand that he's being misunderstood, but any fair reading of what he wrote lends itself to that. And it might be an exaggerated critique of Adams, but it's not as if people are making this up about him. Why was he so edgy about what he so clearly stated in, in the defenses of the Constitution? Um, he's a New England Puritan, a secular Puritan, and um, uh, and he, um, he thinks that human beings are inherently uh, sinful. And he thinks... He, he, he later in his life uh, liked to refer to a painting by Rubens of the Last Supper in which <laughs> the uh, disciples are all looking with great anger and envy at Peter, 
I believe it is, because Jefferson, Jesus is paying attention to Peter. And he said, that is a picture of human nature. Anybody who assumes leadership or exalted position will attract lesser people who attempt to undermine them. Um, and, um, and, and he thought he was to himself a victim of that. I mean, he wasn't really a monarchist. He was a believer in a strong and robust executive, to be sure. And he didn't acquire monarchical values when he was in Europe, as, as Mercy Otis Warren claimed in her history, because he had believed in that before. And in his, in his, con, in his uh, constitution for the state of Massachusetts, which he wrote single-handedly, he wanted the governor to have uh, veto power over everything. Um, and he, so he, he retained, you know, he thought we'd overlearned the lessons of 76 uh, with regard to George III. Now, he was the biggest enemy of George III in the world um, uh, at that time. But um, so, so that he's many of the, mo- of the accusations against him are not correct, but he's the worst possible person to defend himself to. And, um, uh, and so if you read him, uh, you, you sort of well. I you know we'll get into this in those, when we talk about it in the subsequent weeks. But to, I've assigned Adam Jefferson correspondence over the years to many many students at Mount Holyoke and Amherst and Williams and places like that, and um, they all begin assuming Jefferson's going to come out of it their their favorite, and most of them come out thinking so well of Adams, um. Part because he's so gosh darn honest and candid, and he tells you more about himself than Jefferson will. And um, he also can write uh, in a way. I mean, that's to say that he's a better writer than Jefferson is saying a heck of a lot. But these are the two greatest letter writers of an age, not uh, not uh, distinct, not lacking other worthy uh, opponents. Um, so yeah, I love love Adams most, in part because I see more of myself and him than I do in Jefferson, I guess, even though I'm a Southerner from Virginia and I even went to the college of William and Mary and have red hair. And, um, but, uh, but, um, it's not a, uh, Adams, Adams is like, uh, something you have to, it's like an acquired taste. We need to take a break here in just a moment. Uh, but I asked permission earlier if I could be cynical. Now I'm going to ask permission to be optimistic. Uh, I look at the situation we're in now, um, and I, I see a lot of potential good coming out of it. I think people are going to recognize again just how important science is, our oracle, and I see families turning inward and recognizing how important those things that we tend to take for granted are. Um, I see uh, citizens on the street making an effort to smile and wave and acknowledge each other. Uh, I think there's a lot of good that might come out of this and a lot of serious change. Will you allow me that, sir? I will not only allow you that, I'll just applaud and hope to heaven you're right, but I think that like in those crises, like when a, in a hurricane or a tornado hits and first rep- responders come, they don't ask whether you voted for Trump when they save you from your rooftop. Um, uh, and I think that we're going to be all going through this experience together. I like that phrase, alone together again. And, um, and it's going to change us. Coming out of this, um, it's going to be very difficult economically. But as we come out of this... We're not going to be the same, and I think we'll be for the better. Money isn't everything. With that, let's take a short break, and when we come back, I'm really anxious to hear more about what the the two of you gentlemen have planned for the immediate future. We'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. I'm Clay Jenkinson, out of character this week, talking to one of my favorite people in the world, the great historian, Joseph Ellis. And uh, Joe, you've agreed to be kind of uh, regular during this period because there are a couple of things I want to talk about. 
One is about the Jefferson Adams relationship, but particularly the Jefferson Adams correspondence. And then, as you know, I have a new book, uh, Repairing Jefferson's America, a guide to civility and enlightened citizenship. And I've sent you a copy. You've read it. And I know that you have lots to say about it, not all of it entirely positive. And so I'm very eager to have that discussion. So first of all, uh, thank you for being willing to do this. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fire the first shot across the bow here. In the Jefferson Adams correspondence from 1812 until 1826, I think it's fair to say that Jefferson never once wrote an attack or a pointed criticism or a mean-spirited thing about his friend in Massachusetts. But Adams is like he's rabbit punching Jefferson 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Adams loses no opportunity to say you were wrong about this and I was right about that and I I challenge you about this and no doubt you was fast asleep in philosophic tranquility and what think you of terrorism, Mr. Jefferson? Your administration was weak. Even that of Madison is better than yours. Adams cannot be Adams unless he is settling scores with Jefferson. And what must have enraged him is that Jefferson is bobbing and weaving and ducking almost all of the hits. Yeah, but the reason that Jefferson didn't formally attack Adams himself is he paid other people to do it. (laughs) He's right. You're right. Oh, come on. And then denied that he did that. And there's exchange between Jefferson and Abigail Adams. What happens is that Jefferson's uh, younger daughter uh, dies, and Abigail sees this in the paper, and she knew the younger girl, and she wrote a commiserative uh, letter to Jefferson, and Jefferson misconstrued the letter, thinking that it was Abigail speaking also for John, who didn't even, by the way, know that she had written this letter, and that, that they were seeking some kind of reconciliation after they had parted company. And 1800. And he says something like, well, you know, I'm really pleased to be able to write with you and and John again, because there was only one thing he did that upset me. And that was that he had left me with these judges and especially Chief Justice John Marshall. But I'm willing to forgive that, he says. Well, the next letter he gets from Abigail is the most pointed criticism of Jefferson that he ever got in his whole life. It's just saying something. Well, there are people that are critical of Jefferson. Jefferson was a controversial figure in his time. But that it's more, you know, it, this is a personal thing. This is a, someone that knows him very well. And she basically said, she ends the letter saying, faithful are the wounds of a friend. <laughs> this is, I think, a, a, a quote from the Bible somewhere, or um, I'm not sure where it comes from, but somebody will know that. And, um, but she basically tells him he's he's a liar, and he's a duplicitous man. And um, no one says that to Jefferson that way. And um, and uh, Jefferson plays hide and seek inside himself, and then doesn't well anyway. What a great phrase! <laughs> yeah. Plays hide and seek inside himself. I like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, you can see uh, that. We're going to have an interesting conversation about this correspondence between the two of them. This is the one that it goes from 1812 to 1826 when they die. Nobody could make it up. I mean, a novelist that made it up would be thrown out of the room. But they die on the same day, um, July 4th, 1826, within two hours of each other. and happens to be the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. Um, and in my judgment, as a historian, this correspondence is the capstone of the American revolutionary generation, of the end of that era, and that the American Revolution has two different sides to it, and they are the two different sides, and they are not complete until they are with each other, and the revolution is not complete until they are together arguing both sides of it. Fair enough. The, the, the statement, faithful are the wounds of a friend, comes from Proverbs 27, I think. Uh, so she was a very good biblical scholar. Jefferson was, too. You know, I'll let you get away with that cheap shot about Jefferson hiring ruffians to write for him. That, that but, wasn't a cheap uh, shot. That's not a cheap shot. That's, an, I mean, that's a totally accurate but, thing. You know that. But, <laughs> the fact is, Joe, that in the correspondence, if, if correspondence is a two-way thing and it's a feedback mechanism, you will admit that the feedback from Jefferson is... 
Can't we just get along? Let's talk about safe subjects. Let's not really dig too deep into the things that, mm-hmm. that got in the way of us. Let, let's not let anyone sow tears between us. We're too old for this sort of thing. Let's talk about our grandchildren and crops and uh, all the good things in the world, the he, classics, he, he, books. He admits, uh, he says, he's one of the few people that admits to the other, he said to, to, to Adam, he said, you were right about the French Revolution and I was wrong. Yeah, but Adams is not, he's not accepting Jefferson's view that let's try to keep this as civil as we possibly can. Adams' view is... Two things. Adams cares more about this correspondence than Jefferson does. He has more to gain. Both of them know that we're going to be talking on the radio in 200 and some years later about it. At any rate, um, I think that, that if you measure the correspondence, Jefferson wrote, I mean, Adams wrote two letters to every one. At least. Well, as long as we're talking so much about these letters, uh, let me read a few excerpts from them. Uh, The famous letter from Abigail Adams written on May 20th, 1804, after she found out Jefferson's daughter had died. She writes, I have tasted the bitter cup and bow with reverence and humility before the great dispenser of it, without whose permission and overruling providence not a sparrow falls to the ground that you may derive comfort and consolation in this day of your sorrow and affliction from that only source calculated to heal the wounded heart, a firm belief in the being, perfections, and attributes of God is the sincere and ardent wish of her who once took pleasure in subscribing herself to your friend. And Jefferson wrote back that he was, quote, Thankful for the occasion furnished me of expressing my regret that circumstances should have arisen which have seemed to draw a line of separation between us. And later in the letter he wrote, Mr. Adams' friendship and mine began at an earlier date. Now, if he would have stopped there, it probably would have been best, might have led to a path of reconciliation. But he continued on, and then Abigail replied, I have never felt any enmity towards you, sir, for being elected president of the United States. But the instruments made use of and the means which were practiced to effect a change have my utter abhorrence. She calls the writings of James Callender as the basest libel, the lowest and vilest slander. Now, at this time, uh, Adams was home. Jefferson was pretty busy at this point. Jefferson had other things going in his life, like he was founding the University of Virginia at the time. And Abigail Adams gets the last word, writing, This letter is written in confidence. No eye but my own has seen what has passed, and faithful are the wounds of a friend. Well, this is a great preview of what's going to go on between the two of you gentlemen. So here's what we're going to do, David. Uh, we've been, Joe and I have been talking on the phone. We're going to do uh, probably four sessions on the Jefferson Adams friendship and correspondence. And we're actually going to oh, kind great. of track the letters. So I'll divide them up and I'll get this to both um, you and Joe, but it'll be, let's look at the letters from 1812, say to 1814 first. And then we'll, I'll find some logical way to divide them up into four shows. And we'll actually... Um, post some of them and, and we'll be you know we'll be looking at the text as we talk and we'll try to sort this out. I think Joe's absolutely right that this is the culmination and the and the the close and in some sense the resolution of the dynamics of the of the American Revolution with these two extraordinarily talented patriarchs in Adam's words uh, not dying until they have explained themselves to each other. And so it's really rich. And then uh, I want to talk about um, Joe's agreed to um, to, to think about my new book, and you know, I think what what we're going to do there is. A- yeah, I'll be offering verbal blurbs for this book called "Repairing Jefferson's America," which I think is coming out in May, but you can probably order on Amazon early if you want to. That is correct, and and so Joe, I, Joe read it, and he said to me on the phone, "You know, I don't agree with everything in this book," and I said, "Even better." But then I said, are there historical mistakes? And he said, no. Luckily, you didn't make any historical mistakes, but you made your interpretation is too optimistic and it doesn't understand the dynamics of change in American life since Jefferson died in 1826. So this is going to be rich. We'll look forward to that. Sadly, we're going to have to bring this week's conversation to a close. Mr. Ellis, as always, you are a gentleman and I enjoy hearing your thoughts so much. You know, I... I eat and drink this stuff. I, I do think we should be open to events that the world brings forward. And I don't think we were misguided to 
feature that the crisis we're living through and that we will probably still be living through. Thanks so much, Joe. It's been my pleasure and look forward to coming back. And now, sir, it's time for this week's Jefferson Watch. Thank you, David. We all know the cliché that the Chinese character for crisis is also the character for opportunity. It may be overused, but it applies perfectly to this moment in world history. I've now been sheltering in place in my home in Bismarck, North Dakota for 25 days. Much of my income comes from getting on airplanes and flying off to give a talk, a lecture, or a performance somewhere else. So you will understand that things are a little tight here at the New Enlightenment Radio Network barn. My daughter arrived home from Oxford a little more than a week ago. She is self-quarantining in my basement. We will probably be here together for another month at least, and tempted though we are just to watch the entire run of Matlock or Three's Company, we are both working on writing projects and reading great books. Catherine is pursuing a DPhil, a PhD, in early modern history at Oxford University. She had hoped to stay in Britain and ride out the pandemic, but all the libraries in Oxford are boarded up, including one of the world's greatest, the Bodleian. Her college is on lockdown, and the university authorities told every student who can to go back home. But here's the advantage we have over every previous pandemic or catastrophe in world history. She can do much of her research from a town on the Great Plains of America, thanks to the digital revolution. Though the doors are sternly locked at Oxford, every day she penetrates the Bodleian Library with electronic requests and receives high-resolution copies of documents written by Sir Walter Raleigh, Francis Bacon, Queen Elizabeth I, or Mary Queen of Scots. In some ways, it is actually preferable to handle these spectacular documents electronically. The scans are so good that you can see the Elizabethan handwriting more clearly than if you held the old parchment in your hands. No crabby reference librarian is standing over your shoulders, ready to read you the riot act if you commit one of the dozen unstated crimes in the way you hold or touch or even gaze at the document. You can zoom in to study minute ink blots, crossed out words, watermarks, and obscure contractions. My daughter cannot get everything she needs for her thesis in this way, but if she were marooned in my house for six months or a year, she'd be able to make nearly as much progress here as she would if she were living in her flat at Oxford. In fact, the internet is better here than in England. She brought 20 books on the Tower of London and her luggage, and I have a large Renaissance library downstairs myself. Catherine and her Oxford supervisor, who is a professor at Merton College there, communicate by email every couple of days. Both of them have more time on their hands than they would in more normal times. They are concerned about each other's health and welfare, and I believe they will form a closer bond in the shadow of coronavirus than they would have in a pre-pandemic world. They conduct their work tutorials by way of FaceTime. She also keeps up with her mother, her friends, and fellow graduate students with this breathtaking technology, which we have made the mistake of taking for granted. I've had several virtual meetings in the last couple of weeks by way of Zoom and Microsoft's team. They are a little clunky and awkward at times, but they are dramatically better than such technologies were 10 years ago, and this global crisis will drive the virtual meeting technology, along with many, many others, to greater efficiency and perfection. If we can take the electronic classroom and the video conference to higher levels of efficiency and professionalism, we may discover that it is silly, in most cases, to put staff members on airplanes to fly off to meetings and conferences thousands of miles away. That would be good news for the planet and for the green movement. Because I have to think about where my money goes with unprecedented discipline, I turn to online book sites like Google Books before I turn to Amazon.com. Even then, I buy the very least expensive version of the physical books and try wherever possible in buying ebooks to get the ones that are free, or say, the complete works of Dostoevsky for $4.99. We are eating down my larders and my chest freezer. I work harder to save and eat leftovers than previously. We calculate our meals according to the most savor for the least cost. For the first time in many years, when I am at the grocery store, I check food prices carefully and reject things that today seem extravagant, though I would merely have tossed them into the cart even a month ago. I'm working out on the treadmill every day. We are having some late winter here at the barn, but we will take long walks together just as soon as the temperature rises. And this year, my garden is going to be more serious and probably more important than ever before. 
For the past couple of decades, the conservative right has railed against government, especially the federal government, so incessantly and so obnoxiously that we have all moved in that direction just because the rhetorical bombardment is so righteous and unending. But now we see just why we do need government, including a strong national government. Agencies that in times of complacency we may think we can defund, like the pandemic office in the White House, turn out to be vital in times of emergency, which is why they were created in the first place. The countries that have gotten on top of this world crisis have been the ones where the national government has taken a strong lead. Our own national government was late to the table, and even if you avoid the blame game, you have to say that the national leadership in the coronavirus has been characterized by mixed messages, inefficiency, ham-handedness, and at times gross ignorance. We deserve better. You have to be a very dedicated partisan not to think that this situation would have been better handled by Barack Obama, Bill Clinton, Richard Nixon, George Bush Sr., or Lyndon Baines Johnson. We have all been shaken out of our complacency. I don't know about you, but about once a day I find myself in actual disbelief. This cannot have happened. Something like this just can't happen in the 21st century. How can the entire country go on lockdown over a virus? Who would have ever been able to predict that the NBA and the Final Four NCAA tournament would be canceled? That New York's airports are down to 10% of their normal traffic? That the always congested LA freeway system is empty? That not a single restaurant in any major city in America is open for sit-down service? That the greatest ships of the U.S. Navy can be crippled by infection? That the booming economy of the United States could teeter on the brink of actual collapse? That people are dying because they are literally no beds or ventilators in the most overrun hospitals to keep them alive, and that bodies are being stacked up in refrigerator trucks as if this were London in 1665 or the Black Plague in 1348. And the amazing and sobering truth is that we have no real idea of how and when this world catastrophe will end. All we can say is that if this has to happen, it's the best time in human history for it to happen, because a substantial amount of the world's work can be done in sequestration at home. We can keep up with those we love by FaceTime and Skype, and we can order in food, books, groceries, and even in some cases, the medicines we need to survive. Hang in there and read those big books that have eluded you these last 10 years. I'm Clay Jenkinson. We'll see you next week for another important edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any show for a $12 donation, please call 701-575-0727. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.com and on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.com. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at Makoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Bach Cello Suite No. 3 in C Major by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program, Through the Eyes of Thomas Jefferson.